teaching English in Russia's Far East in the late 1990s, New Zealander Rachel Hughes was appalled by the plight of Vladivostok's many street children. I've seen so many different things that have shocked me, that have scared me. I've seen kids living in sewers, in places that I only ever even imagine a human being surviving and alone living. From modest beginnings, she now runs Living Hope, a charity committed to building better lives for these children and their families. So anyhow, I've been here about a month, and I was down in Goom one day in the department store, and it was in December, so you can imagine how cold it was. And I had my big winter jacket on, and I had taken my wallet out, and I was changing my money. And as I went to put my wallet back into my pocket, there was a hand in my pocket. And I turned around to like deal with this person, but this person had big, empty eyes and had dirt all over their face. And he had a big jacket on, which was too big for him, and his sleeves came down here. And you could see that he had nothing on under his coat, no shirt or anything. And instead of getting angry at him, I felt really sad for him. Luckily, he hadn't got my money, so I was able to buy him some food. And when I was feeding him, it just it broke my heart that this little boy was so hungry. So the next day I decided that I'd make some sandwiches and I walked outside and as I saw children that looked hungry, I'd give them sandwiches. And that's how it all started. Probably even within the first few weeks of me feeding the kids and I realised how excited they were seeing me each day and I realised that I couldn't start something I wasn't going to continue that I couldn't just come in, be this kind foreigner that was going to feed these kids food and then just take off and leave them. I started um, using my own income to feed the kids. I had, I'd spent my last money. I had got down to my last 10 rubles and I'd spent it to go and buy apples for the kids and I was out walking the streets giving these kids apples. And translating for me that day was a guy I met at church the day before, and he was a Russian sailor. And at the end of the day, he asked me to wait for him, and I was kind of like, it's minus 30 degrees, I'm going home, there's no way I'm waiting for you. And he kind of really talked me into it, so I waited for him for about half an hour, and he came back and he handed me over $500. And I was shocked, because at that stage when I first got here, like $100 was a month's salary. And basically he just said that, uh, you're going to laugh at this one, <laughs> that three years previously God had told him to start saving money because he needed to give to a woman feeding children on the streets. And when he met me, he knew I was a woman, he handed me over this $500. And it was at that point that I realised that I was doing what I should be doing. And I knew that that's what I'd been called to do. And I knew that I, was, I had to keep going. <laughs> Even with what I've seen over the years, I can only imagine what life is like on the streets for these kids. Um, I've seen so many different things that have shocked me, that have scared me. Um, but what it's really like for them, only each individual kid could tell you. I've seen, um, I've seen kids physically being beaten. I've seen them being abused. I've seen kids come to me with rat bites when they got bitten by rats crawling over them at night times. To me, the, I guess the biggest shock that I've, I saw when I first saw meeting the kids on the street was the way society viewed them. I was sitting at a bus stop and I saw this old lady come down outstairs of an apartment carrying a, a bowl of um, looked like bones and soup or whatever that obviously was leftovers. And I saw these kids sitting outside. I thought, oh, it's great, she's coming down to feed these kids this bowl of soup. And I saw one of the little boys jump up and go to her and saying, Barbushka, Barbushka, like, grandmother, grandmother, please give me something to eat, please give me something to eat. And she picks up her cane and pushes him away with her cane and then puts the bottle suit down for the stray dogs. 
And that's really shocked me that her eyes that the stray dogs were with more than these kids that were obviously hungry. It took me quite a while to learn Russian. I am not a natural language learner. But on the other hand, when I started working with the kids, the language barrier wasn't a problem with them. They just wanted to be with me. Um, I spent a lot of time with them, walking the streets, playing football with them, playing frisbee, just hanging out with them. And it didn't matter. They would just talk, 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 as if I understood everything. And I'd just every now and then nod, and that was enough for them. They just needed somebody in their life. We call our camps for rehabilitation camps. Not only have they got a place where they can sleep um, without danger, not only have they got a place where they're getting fed constantly, we're trying to teach them how to work with each other, how to live together, how to resolve conflict. Uh, we're trying to teach them life skills so that when they leave the camp, they're leaving more equipped than when they came to camp. In the, in the city, there's a sanitation department where we take all the kids before camp. They get um, their hair shampooed, de-liced. We take um, the girls generally for medical checkups um, for, to a gynecologist. Nine times out of ten, or well, most girls, have got some sexual disease of some sort or another, whether it's syphilis or gonorrhea or, or warts or something. So we take them there before camp because in that camp we've got a chance to give them the antibiotics and the medications regularly. Some of them are kids that are constantly on the streets, they live on the streets. Some of them are kids that um, uh, kind of frequent the streets. They've got a lot of friends that are street kids, although they do have homes, but there's problems in the homes, so they might come and go, spend you know, a few nights on the street back home again, you know, kind of backwards and forwards. What happened with your mother? Why do you think she doesn't live with you? My father was with her. She drank and drank. Он нас забрал, ее там оставил. Мы когда были маленькие, года лет 12, вот так, 11, сильно бил. Жена или жить где может быть? В семье. Семья? Какие семьи ты хочешь? Чтобы со мной братья были. Бабушка была. И папа. You know, I'm aware that for some of those kids, that what I have to offer them is more than anybody's ever offered them in their lives. I realised that I wanted to be a constant in their life. I didn't want to just be somebody that came in and left again. I wanted to be somebody that could rely on and they could count on, and that I could help them through all their different problems. And probably, um, as I said, within the first couple of months, within the first month even, I realised I was going to stay in Russia longer than the period that I came for. The goal of Living Hope, the purpose of Living Hope as an organisation is to change the children's lives. We want to take the kids from where they are and give them a future, give them, help them find education, work, places to live, to develop their own families, just to completely change the cycle of their lives. So that's the purpose of Living Hope. I try to apply for funding from uh, anybody that will basically give it to us. We have a mobile kitchen. We invite the kids to come to our day centre where we have classes. Anything that you know we feel that the kid needs help with, we try and work with them in that area. We work with their families, trying to resolve issues, trying to get the children back home if possible. We spend a lot of time visiting children in hospitals, visiting children in prisons, um, and providing for them basic essential things that the family would normally be providing, which are not providing. Ты здесь как ты в новом была? Саша сюда пришла. Да? Приходили. Да, понятно. Они еще придут ко мне. Понятно. This is um, 
the little sister of the family that we're trying to find parents to take her and her two brothers. We've been working with her and her brothers for about five years. We've been trying so hard to find parents to take her and her two brothers so they wouldn't be split up. And so now she's been split up from her brothers and it's hard for her, for us, because we tried so hard to keep them together. Duh. <laughs> The last few months that I've been in New Zealand, I've been writing to Anya saying, I'll take her home to New Zealand with me, <laughs> rather than have her by herself, because we knew that eventually if we couldn't find people for her, she'd be separated from her brother. So I was saying, do everything you can so when I come, I can take her home with me. <laughs> but, When I first got here, as for any foreigner that came into the city, there was a lot of suspicion, um, uncertainty of why I was here, what I wanted here. And I was fully aware that my phone was tapped, that I was followed around the city quite a lot. There'd be times when I'd come home from being out and I'd know they'd been in my apartment. And as I said, like I, I felt they deliberately letting me know that. Uh, a Russian habit is to chew sunflower seeds and throw the husks away. And I'd come home and there'd be husks all over my apartment floor knowing that, you know, I don't eat sunflower seeds, so it wasn't me. And uh, I found it quite amusing that they were so suspicious of me because I knew there was absolutely nothing that I was doing which was illegal or wrong. The initial media attention was very positive and very good. Um, but as we grew and as we started working with more kids and got more of a focal point, we got a lot more accusations in the media. I've been accused of being mafia mama where I was uh, exploiting the kids, like using them for them to go out begging and they were bringing me money. Um, at one stage, once we had a mobile kitchen, I was accused of um, feeding them up, cutting them up and selling them off, as in um, feeding kids up and then selling body parts. I, I don't think I will feel that my work has been done until we have a place for the kids to live. I believe we need a shelter. Mainly, we need to be able to work with the kids permanently. When the kids come and go, they'll come, they'll work with us, we'll be able to progress so far, then they're back onto the streets, back into the influences that are surrounding them. Basically, we, we're wanting a, a place where we can completely turn the kids' life around and give them something to look forward to. They're afraid that we're going to come in um, as capitalists <laughs> and start a business here in the building, and they don't want that. And so he's coming down to say he wants it to be a children's club because it was a children's club and he wants a place for the local children to come. They're wanting a place for their children and they can't come because we've got dirty children. But he's come out here, if you notice, with all his medals on. So uh, to, to show us that he's worth listening to. <laughs> Refusing entrance. I found that the longer time I've been in Russia, the harder it has been to live here. At first, I just loved everything about Russia. I loved the people. I loved even standing in line because to me that was Russia. Um, the cold, the winter was exciting the first year, even though it was freezing. But I found that the longer I lived here, the harder it got. The harder it got to have no water, the harder it got to have power out all the time, the harder it got to be slipping over in the ice and the less patience I got, and I just found that as time grew on, it just got much harder to be here. I've packed my bag so many times, um, but then I'd see another kid's face, or uh, I'd see somebody else on the street, so I'd remember a conversation with a kid, and I'd think, well, that's why I'm here. Because they've got no cigarettes left. And I told Sasha, because it's fine, we've dug a grave for them already.
This belongs to the family of the four girls that we've had at camp all week. There's actually five sisters. We first met the older sister, Natasha, for about five years ago. And since that time, we've been working with the whole family. This is home for the kids when they're at home, although they tend to spend a lot of time on the street. Girls all sleep together, five girls sleep together on one bed. Um, and now there's four of them and one of them sleeps with the mother. Um, the income from this family is from the children. They go out and they steal food, um, beg for food, beg for money, and any money that they get comes, that comes into the house is how the family lives off. There's no income coming in here at all. The mother sometimes has work, sometimes not. It depends on her condition at the time, <laughs> whether she can work or not. Yeah, they knew we were coming this time. So the house was in a much better condition than I've ever seen it. Um, but it was good to see that mother wasn't drunk when we turned up. The good thing is that some of the kids want to go back home after camp. They realise they need to change their lives. They don't want to stay on the streets. That they need to go back to school to have a future. And so um, some of them will go back home and we'll go with them and try and help mediate with the families and try and sort things out like that. Whereas kids that don't have the family situation or don't have the opportunity of going home or don't want to, we just drop off at the streets. And um, it's, it's really hard. It's like you just wish there was something else for them. You wish you had somewhere else to take them. One thing, though, as I um, told myself right at the very beginning, is I never cry in front of the kids about the kids. And so it's, sometimes it's really hard to stay that strong and not cry when you see them and you're with them. But I save my tears till I'm at home. Cry. <laughs> How do you count success? It's, it's, um, we, we can say, OK, we run a camp, and eight kids from camp decide to go back to school. And that's great, that's exciting. They'll go back to school, one kid will go home, maybe a kid will go live with somebody else. But yet, it's, um, to us, that's success, because it's changes, it's steps towards a better life. So we count each step as a success. you have a kid on camp that won't let you touch him for the first few days, and by the end of camp he's hugging you, to me that's a success. When you've got a kid that's never been to school, then by the end of the camp he wants to go back to school, that's a success. Whether he lasts or not, that's still a step towards success, it's still he's made a right choice. You know, same thing if a kid goes home, every time they go home, even if they keep running away, that's that much more of a success, they're making the decision to go back, they're trying to work through the issues rather than running away from them. You know, so I count success by each step a kid takes towards changing their lives for the better. I met Tanya when she was 14. We had been working with her for five years before she decided she wanted to change herself. So we were able to help her find a place to live, give up the drugs, help her get into school. And she's enrolled in studying university this year. I've been waiting for this day for my whole life to graduate from high school. <laughs> I haven't managed it yet, and Tanya is. У которой больше всего количество пятерок. Это Беляниной Татьяне Владимировне, выпускница 11-го а Таня вручается также грамота за хорошие успехи в учебе. Ну, лицом-то ко мне повернись. Молодец. I first started working with the kids and I first started feeding them on the streets and I'd go home at night and I'd just be lying in bed just dreaming about what I could do uh, to help the kids in the future. One of the first things I dreamt of was a place for the kids to come off the streets and we've got that, the day centre. The dream for the rehabilitation centre hasn't come into pass yet but um, 
I wanted to work with the families, I wanted to work with the kids, I wanted to help them get into school, help them get work, and we've been doing that over the years. But I believe that until we can get the reinstation centre, we will not really see huge successes in those areas, because we need to be with the kids 24-7, not just working with them a few hours, a few times a week. Basically, we, we're wanting a, a place where we can completely turn the kids' life around and give them something to look forward to, give them, give them a future. If I'm to be completely honest with myself, I know I'm making a difference, but it doesn't always feel that I am. Sometimes the problems, the pressures, the stresses, the failures, seeing children going to prison, seeing children dying, um, committing suicide, being killed, um, it feels like I'm, I'm working and struggling and, and for nothing, but if I actually stop and, and think and look and remember the things that have happened, remember the little successes and the big successes, then yeah, we are successful in what we do. I can't put words into the mouths of my family, but I felt that for the longest time they couldn't understand it. Um, you know, why wasn't I living at home, having the life of a normal person instead of living in Russia? I think as the years have gone on though, they've kind of seen and understood more of what I'm doing and have accepted it. Although I know that my mum's been dying for me to come home. I never dreamt that I'd be in Russia. I never dreamt that I'd be doing something like this. I had no desire to work with street kids. I had no desire to be in another country. Um, I trained to be a fashion designer, and so at first I thought I was going to take the world by storm as a famous fashion designer. I was going to go to Milan. I was going to, you know, be up there with all the best. I was going to make millions of dollars and prove to everybody how fantastic I was. But I'm here <laughs> instead in Russia. Loved by many kids. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.